All righty. So the content I'm going to be going over today is all around Sockwell. And I, this is some content that I've been meaning to put out on Camp Apex, but building out the content on there in that format just takes a little bit of a long time. So I'm going to do this little video session. And if you guys like it, um, we can keep doing more and cover more advanced topics as we go until I can put content out on the website. I'm going to be going over Sockwell basics, and we're going to be applying that Camp Apex format where we're going to learn in the style of having challenges to solve along the way. Um, and I phrase some of these questions as being like interview style questions. So these are things that you might get asked during developer interviews, or even if in your current role, if you're in an admin role or QA role, um, these are even queries that you might be able to use in your day-to-day -day life to just to optimize your day and optimize your time. So starting off with what SQL is before we start writing it, SQL is its own language, and we use that language to get data from the Salesforce database. Now, in Salesforce, when we talk about databases and tables, we're really referring to S objects. And I'm sure you have created reports in the past with Salesforce where you need to figure out a couple key things when building out your report and pulling your report. And those couple key things that you ask yourselves are, what S object do I want to report on? And what fields from that S object do I want to pull in? Now, you might figure that out and hit the run button on your report builder and quickly realize it pulls down way too much data, more than you'd need. And you tell yourself, oh shoot, I need to apply some filters. I don't need all this data. I just need a subset that meets my criteria. And with Sockwell, we ask ourselves those very same questions. So the thought process and transitioning between creating a report and writing Sockwell is gonna be really easy to grasp. The only thing that we really need to learn here is the syntax of Sockwell. And thankfully, that's pretty easy to pick up too. So SQL, a SQL query is just a statement. And to make that statement work, we need at least two keywords, select and from. And those keywords are going to help us identify the fields and the S objects that we want to query. So I have my Trailhead org pulled up over here. And I'm sure we're all familiar with list views and the reporting view that they provide. But just to touch base with something that we're more familiar with, with the report builder on account, let's say we were given the challenge of writing, not writing a method, it's the wrong one. Let me pull up the right one. Let's say we were asked to write a SQL query to retrieve all accounts and their IDs from Salesforce. Now, if we wanted to do that with the report, just to, as a refresher, we'd go to our report builder, tell it which columns we want to pull in on what uh, standard report type, in this case, account, and we'd be on our way. Now, let's see how we can do the same thing, but with a SQL query. Now, there's a couple different ways to execute SQL queries with Salesforce. You can do it in the developer console. You can use a tool called Workbench. And, but the one I'm going to be using today, my preferred tool is the Salesforce Inspector. If you haven't used that before or heard of it, it's just a free open source Chrome extension that lives within your Salesforce pages and it lets you export and download SQL queries as well as some other really cool features too. So I'm, I'm going to be using the data export feature on that. And remember, I said the main keywords here are going to be select and from. So with the SQL query, I need to tell it what S object I want to grab. So in our case, it's account. And one really cool thing about Inspector too is it's able to do some auto completion for you. So you don't need to write out the whole phrase that you're looking for. So that's it. That's my very first SQL query. I'm, gonna, I'm telling it to select the ID field from the account object. And the capitalization I used is not mandatory. It just makes it a little bit clear for me when I'm reading these SQL queries to help me differentiate between the keywords and the non-keywords. So to export this, I'm just gonna hit that export button. And there you go. Just like the report we saw earlier, we're able to pull all the accounts in our org, 1,013 of them, and all their Salesforce IDs. Now this in itself isn't very helpful. Um, I don't really care about all the IDs. I, I can't differentiate based on the IDs. So I might wanna pull in more fields than just the ID. Say I want to pull in fields like name, website, count, and some other fields. So our next question here is going to be, 
to write a SQL query to retrieve all accounts and their ID, name, website, account number, and billing country. So we're partially there. We're already pulling in the ID for every account. We just need to pull in these other fields. So to do that, we can use a comma separated list and write out all of the API names of the fields that we want. So website, name, account number. And remember, these are the API names, not the labels. So we need the account number field like this. And for billing country, that's all one word because that's that standard uh, API name. And just like that, with our comma separated list, we should be able to hit export and easily grab all of the other columns that the challenge is, is asking us to, to grab. Now, to show you what this would look like with the developer console, really similar, honestly, pop that developer console open. There's a query editor tab here that we can use. And I'll just copy and paste that SOC query in here and hit execute. And just like Inspector, we're able to pull all the data that we need to. But I like Inspector because if I ever needed to export this data, I could just hit these buttons. If I wanted to open it up to, I could just go into the record and see that UI view or the back end view. Cool. Any questions so far? If not, no, no. yeah, go ahead. No, you're good. Go ahead, please. Good. No questions. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so I'll just keep going then. Um, so running the SQL query from Inspector or the Query Editor, that's a great approach if we want to pull in data for analysis. But if we want to use the SQL in our Apex code to pull maybe relevant data for an Apex transaction, using Inspector is not going to be the way to go, right? We're going to have to build these SQL statements into our Apex. So that's going to bring us to our next challenge, where we want to write a method to retrieve all accounts. And that method is going to need to execute a SQL query just like this, but it's going to have to happen with an Apex. So let's see what that would look like. Let me go ahead and I'm just going to create a new class. Let's call it the account selector. And in there, let's go ahead and we need to create a method, right? Let's go ahead and call it get all accounts. And we want to be able to call this from another class. So we're going to make it public. And let's just go ahead and make it static. We don't know the return type just yet. So let's skip that for a second. And let's go ahead and name this guy get all accounts. So in order to get all accounts, let's start writing out just some pseudocode on what we would need to be able to do. We need to define the SQL query to get all accounts. We need to execute the SQL and we need to collect the accounts and eventually we'll need to return the accounts back. So if we know we want to return the accounts back and we know there's going to be many accounts, we that's starting to sound like a list of accounts, not just one singular one. And then from there, let's go ahead and grab, just copy and paste the SQL query that we had before. That should do just fine. Um, but if I tried to save this as is, it wouldn't be able to compile, right? Whole bunch of errors because this is not valid syntax in Apex on itself. In order to execute a SQL query in Apex, we have to surround our SQL statement with the hard brackets, just like this. And follow that statement off with a semicolon. Now this will actually execute the SQL query, but that's not really helpful for us until we can retrieve the results of the SQL query. So to do that, every SQL query is gonna return us either an S object or a list of S objects. So in this case, there's multiple accounts that it's going to return back. We know that because of our the query that we ran here. So in that case, we can set the return type of this um, SQL query to be a list of accounts. And we can just call that all accounts and use the equal sign to set the return of that SQL query. So that takes care of this first step, which was defining the SQL. Anything within those hard brackets is going to cause the SQL to execute. So that's going to take care of that. The accounts are automatically collected and set to this variable for us. So that takes care of that. 
And all we have to do from here is just return those accounts that we got back so we can satisfy the return type condition that we have set up here. So do that, just a simple little return statement where we're gonna return all accounts. And that should take care of that. Let's get rid of that comment. And let's go ahead and try to give this guy a save and see if we get lucky. We did, cool. So to call this and actually test out our method, I'm just gonna open up a anonymous window here. Um, since this is a static method, I don't need to in instantiate and initialize account selector. I can just call get all accounts. So I'm gonna do that. And this should execute. Perfect, so no, no major errors off the bat, but it's not really helpful because we can't see any of the data that we just retrieved, right? So we're gonna go back in, open up that anonymous Apex. And since we know get all accounts is gonna return a list of accounts, let's go ahead and capture that return here. And for every account, let's just loop through all the accounts and print out the name of the account. So to do that, we're just gonna use a for loop. For every account that we got back, we're just gonna do a little system debug here where we're gonna print out account.name, let's say. And if our code works, we should see the account.name printed out 1,013 times. Let's see if that happens. Oh, there it is, a whole bunch. I'm gonna assume that's 1,013, but it looks like it is. So that's how we are able to execute our SQL within Apex. Now let's go on to the next question here, which is that's great that we were able to write a method to retrieve all accounts, but let's uh, update that method a little bit here, or create a new one, I should say, to instead of just retrieving all the accounts, retrieve them and then set their names, or I should say update their names by appending the word corporation to the name of the account. So let's see what that would look like. Let's do that on a different method. It again can be public, it again can be static. We don't know the return type just yet, so let's just uh, keep that out here for now. And let's go ahead and call the method um, update all account names. So in order to achieve this, what do we need to do? We again need to retrieve all the accounts From there, we probably would need to loop through similar to what we did in our anonymous window. But instead of just debugging that, we would need to update the name via the dot operator. So let's go ahead and add that, loop through all accounts and update the name. And in order to actually update, let's just clarify here, update the name via the dot operator update, and then lastly, we want to just update the database and push those uh, new account names back up. So let's go ahead and try that out. So to retrieve all the accounts, we, we did that up here already. So we can, for now, just copy this code here. That should get all our accounts. And what we need to do from there is, again, loop through all the accounts that we get back. And for each account, we have the name which is great, but we need to set that to a new value. The new value is going to be nothing other than the existing name plus the word corporation. I'm just going to leave a space in between so that way when these two strings concatenate, there can be a space and they're not smushed together. Follow that off with our semicolon. And let's see, that takes care of retrieving accounts. That takes care of looping through all accounts. And that takes care of updating the name via the dot operator. But these are all just local changes. None of these are going to commit to the database at this point. So we, what we need to do is actually update the database um, with our update keyword. We're just going to go ahead and update all of those accounts. And that should take care of that. And let's go ahead and try to save. Of course, it won't work because our return type, that's not a valid return type. In this case, we don't need to return anything. So let's just return void and try to save that again. And 
very cool. And now we can test our code by instead of calling get all accounts, let's change that to call update all account names. There we go. And we no longer need this for loop anymore. And this method does not have a return type, so we need to get rid of this. And if this all works as expected, right now, all the account names don't have the word corporation. But after my code runs, when I re-export this, I should see those names update. And that's how we'll validate if our code worked or not. So let's go ahead and give that a try. Well, uh, no exceptions that I can see off the bat. So let's go over here and let's re-export and see if this column updates. It did. Nice, and it looks like every single one updated. So that's an example of how we can actually take advantage of the data that we're pulling into our, um, into our Apex transaction and actually do something interesting with it. Now, there are a couple different ways that we could have written that code that I just want to touch on slightly. This code is uh, exact repetition of the code that we saw here, right? So there's potential for us to, instead of copying that code and pasting it, we could have just called the get all accounts method. And that prevents some maintenance overhead where we don't need to maintain both versions of that method. We can just maintain one version of the SQL query and uh, call that method whenever we need. Another thing that we could do here is you might see sometimes uh, the SQL you might see sometimes um, some folks might build the SQL query or declare the SQL query directly in the for loop. And that's something that we could do here too. Um, let me go ahead and copy this and show that off. So in this case, this is a little bit different than what we saw before because this is called a SQL for loop. And the reason that this is different and it gets its own special name is because internally there's some Apex magic here that Salesforce claims to exist where they are able to efficiently chunk these different um, query calls. And by chunking, all I really mean there is grouping them together in a way that's more efficient for Apex to handle. Um, and it helps us avoid some of the heap limits. And heap is nothing more than just like the memory that a servers using when it's executing your code to keep track of all the, the data that you're referencing in your variables. And it helps us avoid those heap limits if we're processing a lot of data. In this case, that's not super impactful. It's just a thousand records. But if you're in an org where you're querying hundreds of thousands, if not millions of records, um, it might be beneficial to, to lean in there on with that SQL for loop to, to get some of that um, better, more efficient uh, SQL query. So uh, this doesn't fully accomplish the, the method ask. We have to now um, have our own list. So let's just go ahead and get that list going. Do a new list of accounts. And every time we update the count, let's just go ahead and add it to that list. So that way we can keep this update call and keep it updating. So let's see if this is able to save. And let's rerun the code. And this time, since our accounts already have the word corporation, if this works, we should see account name, corporation, corporation. We should see corporation twice. Let's see if that happens. Let me go ahead and repull. There we go. Corporation, corporation. So that's all working as expected. Okay, let's move on to our next challenge here, where we want to select all the accounts where the billing country is Bolivia and Argentina, for example. So uh, just looking at, at the export that we have here, there's a lot of different billing countries, and we don't want all of them. We just want the ones that are tied to Bolivia and Argentina. So to do that, uh, we can use a optional SQL clause called where. 
Because undoubtedly, there's going to be times where you don't want to pull every single account record. You just you just want some of them. And the where clause is the way that we do that. And that's how we filter our data. So the where clause written like that. And all we need to do is tell the where clause what field we care about, in this case, billing country. And we use the equal sign to tell it exactly what value we're looking for. And let's try just pasting it as is and see what happens. It's not going to work. Um, billing country is a string field, so it expects the value that we're looking for to be wrapped in single quotes. So let's go ahead and hit export there. And there we go. We're able to get every every account tied to the billing country Bolivia, which is great, but that's not what the challenge wants. The challenge wants every bill, every account where the billing country is Bolivia and Argentina. So let's go ahead and use the and operator to try to join these together and see what happens there. I'm just going to copy paste, grab the value Argentina. Let's see if this is going to work. It's not, right? Because linguistically, yeah, I said Bolivia and Argentina, but really what I meant was accounts where the billing country is either Bolivia or Argentina. Um, there's no account where the billing country is both Bolivia and Argentina, which is what this SQL query is asking for. Instead, I want accounts where the billing country is Bolivia or Argentina. So let me go ahead and hit export. And there we go. Out of all 1,000 accounts, instead of returning all 1,000, it's able to return just 18 that meet the criteria that we provided. We can spice this up a little bit by, instead of just selecting the countries where it's Bolivia and Argentina, we can add another condition here, too, to only grab the ones that were created after this specified date, um, specified created date. So let's first pull in the created date field and get an idea of of those values. And this should be an exact match. Let's just check here. Yeah, these two. So really what we want is these records and these records because these were all created before these two records. So to do that, we want to and another condition here where we and the created date and set that to be less than that value. And since this is a date value, a date time value, it doesn't need to be uh, wrapped in those single quotes. We can just put the value directly. And I'm going to hit export, and it's not going to work, right? The reason it's not going to work is because the SQL is having a hard time understanding how these conditions are related to each other. It doesn't know if we're trying to say where billing country is Bolivia or Argentina, one statement, and the created date is this. Or if we're trying to say billing country is Bolivia, or it's Argentina, and it was created before the state. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, what we want to do to be really clear about our intent is use parentheses to group these conditions together. So we can say, we can let it know explicitly, we only care about Bolivia or Argentina, and create a date is less than this set date. So perfect. Before we had 18 records, now we only have 16 returned. Um, and just to show you what it would look like if we use those parentheses differently, this version would grab all of the accounts who are tied to Bolivia, but only grab the Argentinian ac accounts that were created before this date. So it's not going to return all of these, it's just going to return one of them. I mean, it's going to return all but one of them. So if I set create a date to, let's say, after, that would just return the one. There we go. Cool. A cleaner way to actually do this, instead of having our or conditions, because we're looking at the same field, is to use another keyword called in. And in lets us basically create a list of uh, values that we want to check for, instead of separating them out like this with the or clause. So I want to look for um, all the accounts where billing country is in either Olivia or Argentina. And to do that, I'll use the in operator. And I need to uh, pass in all my values here via, or not via, all my values need to be inside these parentheses. So I'm going to use Bolivia with a comma. I'm going to separate that and grab Argentina as well. And that lets me go ahead and just delete the other statements there. And I think this looks a little bit cleaner and this should work as well. 
perfect, grabbing all the ones that were created after that timestamp, which makes sense. Let me update this back to seven. We should get our 16 again. There we go. Perfect. Boom, boom, boom. Let's see. From here, there's another keyword that we can use uh, to limit how much data that we get back. So maybe you don't want all 16 records or think about if you're in an org that has accounts where there's millions of Argentine and, and Bolivian accounts and you just want a handful of them. We can use another operator called limit to say, hey, don't return all the records that meet this criteria, just return, let's say one. So limit of one is just going to return us the one record. We can update that to 10. It'll just return 10. And there were 16 records, if I remember correctly. And what's nice is you can still go above that. So I could put return the first 2000. And even though there's only 16, it's not going to error out or anything. It's it's going to end gracefully and give me just the 16 accounts that are there. And the last thing I want to talk about with the time that we have left is um, a really cool one called like. And let me throw up the example or the challenge here. So say we want to find all the accounts in the system that might be duplicates with one another. And we're going to use the name of the account as a matching condition for that duplicate detection. So for example here, let's just pick on this guy or another one, Babel Storm, for example. Let's pull in all the accounts where the name is equal to Babel Storm. Babelstorm Corporate. I can spell. I cannot spell. There, I'm going to use. Oh, Corporation. My bad. Or name. So off the bat, we we see here, if we do the um, equals operator, we're able to pick up on those two um, accounts that share the same name, which is great. That Those are duplicates probably. But what we're really interested in is those scenarios where the names aren't exactly the same. So let's just hop in here real quick and change the name of the account from PhotoList Corporation Corporation just back to PhotoList. Great, that went through. So now if I requery this, I'm not gonna get both these back. I'm just gonna get one of them. But there is another account with photo list in the name that we want to have show up in here. So to do that, instead of looking for an exact match with the equal operator, what we're gonna do instead is use the like operator. And the like operator allows us to use a wildcard in our search. And a wildcard is basically a way to represent unknown characters. So this wildcard symbol is actually just uh, the percentage sign. And I can put that anywhere that I want to uh, match any unknown characters. So in this case, I don't care about Photolist Corporation Corporation. I just want to find any account where the name starts with Photolist and ends with any other character. This could also be no characters. So if I hit export here, there we go. I'm able to pick up both these accounts again because it's able to match all these characters as unknowns and the absence of characters here is, as unknowns as well. Now, uh, we could put that wildcard anywhere, but if we, for example, had put it at the beginning, it wouldn't have pulled in those same accounts because it's not matching the end of the string. It's expecting the string to end in photo list. So to fix that, we uh, need to have the ampersand there at the end. And because of time, I'm going to go ahead and end there. 